In nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et honor mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secula. Morning. Timothy Flanders. With the Terror of Demons morning show, joined as always by co-host Kennedy Hall. Ca Kennedy, how you doing? Good. How are you? Excellent. Everybody, check out Kennedy's website, Kennedy Hall. Ca. What do you got? What do you got for us at at uh, your website, Kennedy? It, it's basically a landing spot for the stuff I do. So you go there and books and Fatima Center stuff. It's just rather than telling people to go to ten different places, just go to one place. Yeah, Kennedy has his own show. Just so you know. So Kennedy has yeah. his own show <laughs> called The Kennedy Report, which is excellent. And so check that out. It's at the Fatima Center YouTube channel. What's uh, what's the latest from The Kennedy Report? Something about it's called St. Joseph Hero of Christmas. So we did. Um, we wanted to do some more sort of like uplifting, uh, you know, things for the holiday season, you know, for Christmas season coming up. So for Advent, we have four Advent theme ones. Awesome. So uh, next week we have an Our Lady Guadalupe one, which I'm really excited about because oh, that's, yeah. it's my my most personal, it's my most personal, uh, personally meaningful devotion. Yeah, that's a, we have a very exciting week this week. Yesterday was Saint Nicholas Day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot my missile. I'm gonna have to go off screen and get the missile in a second. But the uh, so, so we got Saint Nicholas Day. Mm-hmm. We got Saint Amber's Day today. Tomorrow we have Immaculate Conception. Mm-hmm. Wednesday we have Saint Juan Diego. Yeah, I love Saint Juan Diego. And then we have the um, Thursday Saint uh, Saint Melchiades, if you know who that is. Then we have uh, Saint Damasus, the uh, the Pope who commissioned Saint Jerome to write and translate the Vulgate. And then, of course, Our Lady of Guadalupe mm-hmm. on Saturday. Uh, so this is the second Sunday, second week after Advent. So I'm going to go grab my missile. Kennedy, can you tell the viewers any Christmas traditions or Advent traditions or any type of Marian traditions you have for these two great Marian feasts? Anything sure. you got? Yeah. Well, uh, since Our Lady of Guadalupe <laughs> is Mexican, we tend to do Mexican stuff. So to be honest, on Saturday, we'll most likely have some sort of Mexican feast. Now we're gringos, so that'll be tacos the way that you know you get them from the grocery store and we'll make them whatever um also um we like to adorn our house with sort of mexican decorations for the day um it is a new feast uh in the new calendar so i don't know if there is much difference in the old liturgical rubrics uh, i don't know if they have the things in, do they have uh tim do they have in the old like for the traditional mass our lady guadalupe is a newer feast day isn't it like universally mm, good question I think it's an old, like it's regionally been around forever, but December 12th, I think it's a new calendar one. So I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, according to my tan calendar, once again, you should buy this tan calendar. In my opinion, I think it's the best because tan, it, uh, they, so they're, what they do is they have all the feasts and they, they specify which ones are which too. So okay. for example, San Juan Diego is on the new calendar. So that is mm-hmm. not on the old calendar. Yeah. Um, so, so you got that, but on my t- calendar, it says that it was a local feast. Yeah. So, and looking at my, yeah, it's not in the 1962 missile. So right. definitely, I mean, this is like, we, there are issues with the new calendar, obviously, but some well, of these things are just things. no brainer. Like, yeah, St. Saint, Saint Padre Pio, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. St. Jacinta. Right. Yeah. 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 So we, I was just saying when you were off camera that we like to do sort of Mexican themed stuff oh, yeah. on, on yeah, that we, day. us too definitely we have a mexican mexican uh feast so i just wanted to point out two great things about uh liturgically that i really love um this is this is the time of year where i had my my novus ordo red pill and i always really? remember it because these texts always come up again and i was the 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 reason i had a novus ordo red pill was basically through studying the texts of the novus ordo and one of the one of the texts is the post communion from this past Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent, which is, it was actually a double hair day, Saturday, Sunday of Advent, and the Feast of Saint Nicholas. But it, it says this: "Filled with the food of spiritual nourishment, we humbly, great, 
entreat thee, O Lord, that by our partaking of this mystery, thou wouldst teach us to despise the things of earth and to love those of heaven. The, the despising of things of earth is a phrase which comes in the tradition, which was targeted by the Novus Ordo because the despise of the things of earth was deemed, quote, contrary to modern Christian ideas, end quote. And that's really? a quote from Comme le Poivre in 1969, which was the translation um, philosophy approved by Paul VI and then revoked by John Paul II later in 19, or 2004. So then, then mm. even more poignant, you have the collect of St. Nicholas. O God, who didst adorn the blessed Bishop Nicholas with countless miracles, grant we <clears throat> beseech thee that by his merits and prayers we may be delivered from the flames of hell. That was contrary to modern Christian ideas, so they excise <laughs> that too. Yeah. And then when we get to the Feast of the Holy Innocents, we'll get another another dose of that. So anyhow, totally other topic, but uh, make sure that you, if even if you have to go to the Novus Ordo, make sure you get a 1962 missile and read yeah. from this missile because yeah. the text that you will get, not even the translation, because I know Latin, I looked at the Latin and, you know, we've, there's finally a, a proper translation even of the Novus Ordo, which is good. At least there's a proper translation. But even in the original Latin of the Novus Ordo, there's these types of things happening. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem because it goes right back to the Latin text of the Novus Ordo. Well, Cardinal Ottaviani, when they did their study, uh, like late 1960s of the New Mass, they were doing it of the, like the full New Mass of the Latin. Everyone calls it the unicorn Novus Ordo, you know, right? They were doing the study of the, of the best case Novus Ordo Mise that you could do in Latin. So just the basic theological underpinnings are off. And anyway, everyone should read, I have the book over my shelf over there, but um, Michael Davies, Cran yeah. no, Cran Cranmer's Godly Order. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, that for me was a, do you have it there? Yeah, it's, it's, a, the, ma uh, it's a massive red pill because um, one, one, one part that really, two things that really, floored me there you go reading that book one was the term sacramental sacramentally um obviously we have sacramentals like benedictine medals and, and that sort of thing that's not what i'm talking about but the reformers so-called when they would talk about um the lord's supper you know they use the word christ is sacramentally present now they intentionally use that word because it meant that christ was not substantially present but in the sacrament, he was symbolized. That's what they meant. So it was a way of duping the faithful Catholics. Because England was a faithful Catholic nation. I mean, they, you know, they, they had to basically by military order make them stop praying rosaries. They were just Catholics. And um, <clears throat> so I remember a few years ago, I was in Ireland about three years ago at a, at a wedding. And we were at a mass. And it was a terrible clown mass, whatever. Now that I look back, I wasn't as, wasn't as aware of things then. But I remember the priest kept, you know, making up as he goes along some of the mass. <laughs> And, um, but he kept saying, Christ is sacramentally present, sacramentally present. And I remember that's not sitting well with me thinking, I mean, yeah, that sounds kind of orthodox, but there's something weird about that. Now I know. And that made me realize because sometimes, um, you know, some, some of us, uh, traditionalists might say, Hey, be careful with the Novus Ordo only because you don't know if the priest is going to do a valid consecration. And I've said that to people before and they go, Whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, no, it's not that. Listen, to have a valid consecration, you have to have form, matter, and intent. The form is say the words. The matter is have the stuff, that the proper matter, and the intent is to intend to do what the church does. It doesn't mean you have to intend to do. Um, it doesn't mean that the priest himself has to have insane supernatural faith and intend to have this intimate connection with the Holy Eucharist. No, I mean, you could have a crisis of faith and still be a priest. But it means you have to intend to do, do what the church does. So you have to intend to transubstantiate. Well, I realized how many times I'd heard this term sacramentally present from these priests who were um, just really Protestant and really modernist. And I'm thinking, and I, and I thought to myself, I said, you know, those crazy trads, they were onto something when they said, you don't know if it's valid because you don't know what his intent was. Because here's the thing, think about it. If I intend, if you don't believe in transubstantiation as a priest, which is clearly the case with, with unfortunately some of them, you don't intend to do what the church intends to do. So whether or not it's a valid consecration, it's not something that you can uh, easily know, but it's something to be aware of. And that's what that book made me realize. 
And then the next thing that made me uh, realize was the instantiation of table altars was totally a, um, I mean, it was happening on the continent as well. Parameter tables. That, yeah. But, yeah. But the way that it happened in, in England was insane. And like they, ha they themselves had disdain for them. It was weird the, the way they would treat them. Um, anyway, so it just, uh, yeah. when I read that book, I thought I'm just reading about the new mass. Yeah, this is this is something that I'm going to be covering in my own book as well, which is that the English state were masters of propaganda, mm -hmm. masters, absolute masters. When Elizabeth ascended the throne, the England was Catholic, literally. Everybody mm -hmm. was Catholic. When she died, everyone was Protestant, and that's mm -hmm. because she was a master of propaganda. Anyway, another another show for another yeah. time. So <clears throat> I, we wanted to highlight, um, uh, unfortunately, a very tragic uh, thing that happened. Uh, John Morehouse over at Tan. Uh, this is his wife, uh, him and his wife and his family. Uh, he died suddenly over the weekend. And this is a, a great man. I, I've, I've been working with him for this book that I've been writing for Tan. He's been my guy at Tan that I've been working with. Great guy. Um, wonderful human being. Um, I know I'm sure people who have known him more than far more than I uh, can testify. And he, so he left behind his widow and his five children. So they need your support. They've currently got 20,000. They need 150,000. So please support John Morehouse's widow and his children. Please pray for the repose of his soul. We will pray for his uh, repose at the, our father at the end of the show. So please support John Morehouse. The, um, that link is below. But uh, so please support that very tragic thing happening to the Catholic uh, family in the United States. Um, but uh, let's see, I just but I just had a chat come in from Patrick, um, a Thanksgiving. He says, I would like to inform you, my daughter is doing well. We prayed for Patrick's daughter. She went through surgery. Surgery went above expectations. She's already home for the further recover. Thank you for all your prayers. So we also thank God for. Uh, Patrick's daughter and her recovery. So we'll offer up our prayers, our father for the Morehouses and uh, Thanksgiving for Patrick's daughter. So we want to cover two quick things about our last show, and then we'll get into the main topic, which is the day of judgment and the great reset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we have any time, we'll talk about Christmas gifts, but <laughs> I've probably run out of time for here. But so one quick thing, there's another link below to a very important recent talk from Ripperger over yeah. on BitChute which is the oh, it's channel now. Yeah. It's well there. This show is on bit shoot. So go over and watch oh. this show. If you want more information about the vaccines and the moral theology, there's one quick correction. We said last week that the document about vaccine is from the CDF. It's actually from a group of theologians mm -hmm. associated with the CG CDF. So they're not, it's not technically magisterium or technically it's has a high authority, but um, that, that uh, show goes into it, but here's the bottom line. Basically, um, we cannot take a vaccine that has any sort of participation in the murder of children, whether that's derived directly from the body of a murdered child or, or, uh, taken, or it is actually a part of the murdered child replicated. Uh, we cannot do that unless there is a grave cause, yeah. which is defined by a grave cause is in two aspects. One, it's a grave cause of the common good, which is when we have, uh, you know, the I was it was mentioned uh, recently, like the Spanish flu killed two percent of the entire world's population. Mm -hmm. That was a pandemic where it was a massive, you know, it was, things were shut down as a pandemic. Uh, the Black Death is estimated to have killed thirty to forty percent of the world's population. Uh, so that's that was even far worse. So the, these are serious, serious uh, common, grave cause for the common good. Now, on the other hand, you can also have grave cause for your own personal health situation. You, if you your personal health or you know someone who has a personal health issue who has a serious health risk for whatever reason, that could be a grave cause for them personally, uh, aside from grave cause. So we, we always want to, when we criticize this whole thing, we, we always want to emphasize there are people dying. You know, the virus is real. You know, I've had people I've known who have been affected severely by it and whatnot. So it's, we are not at all trying to de-emphasize that at all. But 
we're trying to give people that this is the bottom line is that we cannot do that. So currently the, the, the data does not indicate that COVID, despite the fact that it's affected many people to have been a grave cause of the common good, because it's only killed uh, 0.06% of the population of the United States last I checked. So that's not at all. Uh, it's not even close to the Spanish flu. Um, so in terms of the common good, it doesn't seem to have reached the grave cause uh, a point, but an individual could have a grave cause depending on their, well, um, and the grave and the grave cause could be, um, circumstantial, you know, right. Like, right. Uh, you're in the military and military makes you do what they make you do. And, um, you are, they base your job. You've got kids, whatever, take the thing or you can't be, and you just have to follow orders sort of thing. It's not intrinsically evil to take a vaccine per se. Um, and your participation in that is remote at best and far. And you are in the, basically you're in the, you're in the spot where if you don't take it, you'll be discharged or whatever. And so yeah, those the, are things Paul Ripper goes over as well. Yeah. So you, you, there's a grave cause, like we talked about, like it's a grave cause can justify a woman leaving home and working outside the mm -hmm. home. If they, do, if, if, you know, they, that we have to have that income so that we can keep our house, Yeah, you know, we can keep, but even when those things are the case, you still need to be working towards um, mm -hmm. getting some other situation. He, um, in, in the show, he uses the example of a woman who works at an abortion clinic as like a secretary. Right. And someone says, well, does she have to leave her job right away? And he says, well, no, she technically doesn't have to leave like that moment if that's how she pays rent. But she immediately has to work towards a second solution. And that's circumstantial again. Right. And it's the same thing with the vaccine. Like, listen, we don't have mandatory vaccines in Canada uh, as a rule. I think there's certain ones you might have to have to travel, like to the Caribbean, like hepatitis B or something. I don't know. Um, but we don't have mandatory vaccines to live as a Canadian. Right. Um, and we don't even have them in school. But it could be that you are like a flight attendant or something. And all of a sudden, the airlines are saying, if you don't get this, you can't work for us. That's illegal probably and it'll go to the courts but in the interim what do you do so that's one of those situations he says you can consider if you've and also you have to have sought to have another vaccine like there's 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 ones that are there's a uh, three or four options and there's one that uh, is not tested with or used fetal cell lines it seems and so he says if that's possible you would try to get that one as you would with any vaccine if you wanted it um and then you, you just basically try the other options and once you've done that then you have your grave cough and you've done the steps you have to yeah so currently currently the pfizer and the moderna vaccines are both derived from murdered children yeah um yeah the <clears throat> and then if you go to cogforlife.org that's c-o-g children of mm -hmm. god stands for children of god c-o-g for life.org that one goes into much more detail in terms of which ones are which so check that out for more information um <clears throat> And we'll continue to cover that as, as needed. <clears throat> now, when we talked about Santa Claus last week, there was a lot of concern about lying to their, to your children. And this is a valid concern because lying is intrinsically evil. It's an intrinsic evil. You can never lie, which is lying is defined as representing a falsehood with the intention to deceive. For example, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it is saying something false <clears throat> in order to deceive someone else and make them think something false. Um, so, so the, so it's always a sin period, always a sin. Now the, um, the moral theology, however, distinguishes, um, you, you're not required, you know, if, if the, 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 the classic example is, uh, you're hiding Jews from the Nazis yeah. and the Nazis come and they ask you, are you hiding Jews? Um, now you, at that point you have two choices. You can either say nothing. Mm -hmm which is kind of indicates that you, you know, kind of reveals you, um, or you can use a mental reservation. A mental reservation is something where you, you say, um, <clears throat> you say something which is not a lie. You're not, um, you're basically reserving the truth because this person has no right to the truth. He's a Nazi, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and you're basically saying something that a prudent man could figure out. So if you're if this Nazi is smart enough, he could figure out what you're really saying. Um, but you're not really saying the the you know the fullness of the truth. So um 
I don't know what example of what you would say, but it, the rental reservation is essentially. Um, you would, would, you would say something like, why would I do that? I know what the punishment would be. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I, it's it's difficult. I mean, you you should never do a rental reservation unless there's a grave cause for it. Now, <clears throat> when I when I thought about this, I thought about Santa Claus as basically essentially you're, you're just make your you're you're playing make believe with your children is what you're doing. You're, you're personifying the spirit of Christmas mm -hmm. and you're playing make believe with your children. So I thought to myself, there are some, you know, some parents go to great lengths to basically, uh, you know, they set out cookies, they do all this stuff and they try to, they, and there's like, you know, movies about if you only believed in Santa Claus, just believe in me, the spirit of Christmas. And I thought to myself, it, it seems to me that that does go too far because that's basically, that's basically cr trying to create, it's trying to make the children truly believe in Santa Claus as if Santa Claus were actually real. Uh, to me, that is a deception. That would be like that would be like lying. But uh, in terms of when we when when we talk to our children, we play make believe, or or we uh, we're basically just explaining something that's true in a way that they'll understand, mm -hmm. which is another sort of form of communicate with our children. Um, that is not intending for them to rationally believe in Santa Claus. No, and I think it would depend for example with the cookie example like like if i'm playing in the backyard with my kids and i'm like oh there's this show it's called totoro it's this old japanese show anyway it's silly whatever and there's this big panda thing in it and i've watched the show with my kids it's a fun show anyway point is they said to me dad have you ever seen the totoro and i was like oh yeah oh yeah my, my kids are five four and three and almost three and one so and i they said really and I, oh yeah it was as big as the van anyway it's this like running joke we have. And I'm like, oh, he was in the backyard and they go and they run and whatever. I mean, I guess I'm intending, but like they kind of go, no, he's not. And I said, yeah, he was. You didn't see him. And we have this game and then they'll go around in the backyard looking for this. It's like our ancestors would talk about fairies and stuff. I mean, like with little children, if you're playing make believe, there's a there's a line I guess you could cross, but you'll know that line when you're there. I mean, if your kid is seven years old, eight years old, nine years old and has reason and is saying, Dad, you need to tell me right now, is believing in Santa Claus like believing in God? And if you say, oh, yeah, I mean, then obviously you're kind of crossing the line. But um, if you're just playing like you're playing a game with your children, you play games with your kids and you might have props, you might have um you might have make believe little adventures you have with each other and it stokes their imagination. Uh, and then as they age, they figure it out. And that's, you do that in a million different ways. Honestly, like I love me some trads. Okay. Don't get me wrong. And actually I see this amongst conservative Catholics as well, because actually my friends who are the most anti Santa Claus, I find a lot of them, they were people that were like really stuck in the Novus Ordo for a lot of years. So they rejected like everything that was not 150% geared towards jesus christ you know like explicitly so they were like you know the easter bunny takes away from the resurrection santa claus takes away from the birth of christ and like it's there's no way they can mix you know and i get that because you're resisting the culture right um but you know children are little kids and they have fun and you play little games with them and you tell stories around a campfire and you Charles Coulomb always talks about this, you know, the the veil between what's real and not real. It gets very thin certain times of the year because you're having fun. You know the line you've crossed. If your kid stays up, I mean, I was in grade four, I think, and I stayed up at night and I looked, slept in the living room and I saw my parents bring in some presents. <laughs> and um, it was kind of like, well, that happened, you know, and no one really talked about it and we just sort of... And you just get it, right? They didn't sit me down and try to convince me and, and like make a dissertation about Santa Claus is real. It was just the game we played. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But playing Maple Leaf with your kids is not the same thing as deception. Yeah, it's <clears throat> to me, it, it seems to be this of the same thing as folklore. It's folklore, exactly. Where where you have St. Martin, I think it's Martin Miss, where Martin Miss, where at you go to the Martin Miss Mass, <laughs> Martin Miss. You go to Martin Mass. Yeah. And uh, I think it's like you look across the congregation and then everyone who's like looking a certain way is going to be people who will get married the next year or something kind of thing. So yeah. it's just sort of a it, it's that's that is a folklore thing. Every prudent man knows that that's not actually real. 
Yeah. It's just sort of a a fun thing. It's like it's like uh you know when your wife gets pregnant, there's all these um what do they call them? Old wives' tales or or you know there's little things where you if you if you dangle a, a carnation, you know which the gender is or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just these little things that are uh. <clears throat> nope, no one really believes them. And if they do, it's more of like a superstitious type of thing. But um, I, this is something that I think parents had have an easy time understanding, I think. Um, but it can be difficult for people yeah. who don't have kids. Yeah. Um, there was a qu- quick question in the chat over from Patrick. Is the severity of a lie related to the potential outcome? I was trying to find the um, I don't I haven't been able to find it quick, quickly enough in here. But yes, the, the lying itself is venial or it's uh, intrinsically evil it's always sinful but it can be venial or mortal depending on the circumstance bottom line basically so um <clears throat> so anyhow the day of judgment so we've been trying to focus on the four last things for uh, advent and uh death judgment hell and heaven mm-hmm. so this week is judgment mm-hmm. so kennedy tell us about the book you've been reading i'm reading this book it's um where is it there you go Called the four last things and it's by father martin von Kochum. it's like 300 years old it's amazing you can get it from tan books and um it will scare the hell out of you literally which is a good thing and so it's it meditates on the four last things which is common during penitential penitential seasons like lent and advent and um this week i just read or i'm reading about judgment and we have two judgments we have the judgment of our personal judgment so we are judged when we die there are certain stories. This is a this is a hard one to distinguish. Sometimes there are certain stories of people who die in state of mortal sin, and they sort of are given like a second chance or something, or they see something, or someone's praying for. There is a there is this aspect of when you cross the line, when you cross over into eternity, that you're in like a timeless moment. Um, so there are certain, and it's not just a new mass thing, like no, no, modernist thing. There are certain legit opinions by people that you would trust talking about you know mystical things where saint so-and-so or talks about whoever who basically was going to go to hell if it wasn't for the prayers at that moment i don't know so but the point is is when you go across from life to death you are judged and normally speaking like all things in the church we leave exceptions as exceptional okay so when you go across you're judged and you go up or down (laughs) <laughs> um, I guess purgatory is technically down. So um, usually you go there if you're in a state of grace. But nonetheless, you have your personal judgment. So that will be, you know, account for your sins and you're not in a state of grace and stand in front of the judge and so forth. But there's also the last judgment. And there's actually a ton in the scriptures about the last judgment. Um, and this book is so great because it takes, um, it's nice to read books like this because sometimes when you're trying to read things about the faith, they can almost get like overly academic in the sense that like, listen, if I'm going to pick up a book by Tan Books or a good publisher and it's written by a priest and it's 300 years old, I trust that that priest is telling me stuff that is true. Mm -hmm. So I don't need a citation every time he says an idea, but he'll just say something like in the opinion of the church fathers. And then he just goes and just lays it all out in a nice narrative, which is great because he's telling me what, if you're reading seven or eight church fathers, he's just putting it together for you. Right? So Um, but he points to all the scriptural signs as well. So for example, for the last judgment, he talks about, he says, uh, when Christ says, um, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations, men withering away for fear and expectation for what shall come upon the whole earth. For there shall be then great tribulation, such as hath not been from the beginning of the world until now. Um, and that's a sign that will come before the last judgment and the last judgment will be the second coming. So whenever people get on their whole, um, is this the end times? To be honest, there are certain signs that we know have to happen before we're in the actual end times. They could happen fast, but one of those signs Christ tells us about is basically the the world is going to experience an insane tribulation, which will have something like a conflagration. Um, St. Jerome uh, elaborates and he says, the heavens will be overcast with heavy clouds and a dreadful tempest will arise. The force of the wind will carry the inhabitants of the earth off earth off their feet and whirl them aloft in the air. Trees will be uprooted, houses unroofed. Long peals of thunder will resound in the heavens like flashes of lightning, like serpents of fire will light up the sky. 
and with their forked tongues playing about dwellings of mankind will kindle a general conflagration, which is like a burning of the whole earth, amid the crash of thunder. The waters of the ocean will be so agitated that their waves will rise mountain high, towering almost to the clouds. The roaring and raging of the storm-wept billows will last for some time. All the beasts of the earth will lift up their voice, and their dismal howls will fill the air so that the hearts of men will stand still for terror. And that's just part of what he goes on about. And uh, part of the last judgment of as well is the resurrection of the dead. And in this book, he goes... Everyone should pick up this book. It'll scare the hell out of you. And um, he talks about how the two types of resurrection. So the resurrection of the body of the just and the resurrection of the body of the damned. And basically, it's a joyous occasion. And this will be at the sound of the trumpet, which is talked about in Revelation and other places. Um, and there'll be a calling forth of all the dead. And the resurrection of the just will be a joyous thing. Um, it'll be a, reun uh, a reunion of the soul and the body. And he talks about the bodies of the just at that moment being like incorruptibles in their caskets. Uh, and people will sometimes ask, for example, what happens if you're cremated, whatever. He dresses that in this book. And there is literally, I mean, it's a miraculous event. Okay. So it's kind of, you know, but literally every particle of every person is brought back together. And um, conversely, the same thing happens for the resurrection of the dead for the wicked. And um, that will be the greatest tragedy and the great, even though those souls are in hell, this will be something they'll want to go back to hell because that moment will be so severe because not only will they see their, 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 their basically the, the church fathers say that the wicked will look like demons, like they'll be more like demons than people. <clears throat> and um, seeing themselves in contrast to the, the, the just will be too much to bear. And um, apparently it's all going to take place in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot in this book and the resurrection of the body, the second coming of Christ, those all happen at the last judgment. And um, it sounds simultaneously amazing and simultaneously absolutely terrifying. Um, so I recommend everyone get this book. What tells the uh, title and the author one more time? It's just called uh, the four last things: judgment, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. And it is by Father. Where is it? Father Martin von Kochem. Okay, it's a tan book classic. If you go to their website, I don't know if it's one of their five dollar books. Um, I found at the Fatima Center we have we were clearing out because we're moving, so I just found it. This this copy is like thirty years old, but um, it is excellent. incredible. Yeah, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that points to. Uh... <clears throat> The way our our Lord in the scriptures <clears throat> uses the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem as an icon of the end times. So mm -hmm. in his discourse in the Gospels, he actually speaks about the destruction of the temple and the end times at the same time. And he the words he's using here refer to both things at the same time. This is the way the scripture yeah. works. So yeah. these these so when you when you read the history, this is something we're we're gonna go over in our Bible study show, the um the Holy Bible introduction. We're gonna go through Book of Acts and Revelation and talk about the destruction of the temple. And when you read the description of what happened when God destroyed the second temple, you will cry for fear because they they there was a famine and then they were besieged and they were reduced to cannibalism mm -hmm. inside the siege mm -hmm. and they were and then the the whole city and the temple were raised to the ground and burned to the ground and totally mm -hmm. destroyed and so that is the type of destruction that we're talking about in the end times but it's at, on the massive scale so that is the type of end times signs that we're talking about now um there have been many and we're going to talk about the great reset <clears throat> now at the same time, there has been many moments in history where our fathers believed that the end times were happening. Yeah. For example, the Mohammedan invasions. That yeah. is what many, many, there were many apocalyptic, uh, much apocalyptic literature believing that the end times were imminent when the Mohammedans yeah. invade. They, they just suddenly invade and it swept across most of the Christian world at that time. Yeah. It just, boom, there were, it was it. Uh, you know, the, the Black Death that we mentioned, that was believed to be the end times as well. Uh, widespread death, bodies in the streets, you know. So <clears throat> despite how bad it is right now, you know, most of us are not experiencing a massive invasion 
most of us are not, not experiencing bodies in the street. I mean, so based on the descriptions that you're talking about, I mean, I think that things have got to got have got to got got to get so much worse mm -hmm. to really look at the signs that we're talking about to really think that's truly imminent now. But like you said, it could come right away. Uh, mm -hmm. But the other thing that you're you're really the thing that we really need to be focusing on is our own particular judgment. And I wanted to mm -hmm. mention uh, Matthew 25. 43 which is where it's talking about the it this is talking about the last judgment but there's a there's a particular judgment because the last judgment is a, a recap, recapitulation of your particular judgment you die and you go to your particular judgment god sends you you're you're going to heaven or hell and then you resurrect at the last judgment which recapitulates your particular judgment so this is the recapitulation this is when our lord speaks to each person who is being judged and the wicked say, say, uh, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to thee? Then he, Jesus, will answer them saying, amen, I say to you, as long as you did it not to one of the least, neither did you do it to me. And these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the just into a life everlasting. So this is a reminder that it is a mortal sin to not help the poor in certain circumstances if you have the money or you have the time you have you're you've fulfilled all your duties of your state in life you you you've got your wife and children all taken care of you have extra money you don't need you have extra time you don't need there's something extra that's extraneous saint thomas says it is a mortal sin to neglect the poor the person poor person who's right in front of you person who's right in front of you who's asking you on the street or whatever it is a mortal sin at that point and this is what what he goes into. And I, I'll link another article where we talk about this. So in certain circumstances, not in all circumstances, but it is very, very important that we help the poor. And this is something that our Lord says is one of one of the fundamental aspects of the final judgment is helping the poor. Now, there's different aspects to helping the poor. And the greater help is actually the spiritual help. St. Thomas says, again, th this is actually a, a greater thing to help them spiritually do the spiritual works of mercy. But the, he also says that a poor man who is starving cannot, he cannot be helped spiritually, or he needs the bodily needs first before he can get the spiritual, which is the higher, obviously. So in that case, you need to feed him first and then give him the gospel, that type of thing. So it's very, very important because unfortunately, the the church's effort for the poor have been co-opted by Marxists in the mm -hmm. past century, which is a, a great tragedy because the poor need our help. And it's a fundamental aspect of the gospel. Fundamental aspect of being a Christian is helping the poor. And mm -hmm. as a result of Marxism, this is something that gets neglected. And so we need to be aware of that, especially in this time when we've mentioned this before, in the time that we're dealing with with the lockdown, many people are being evicted out of their homes or going on unemployment. So it's a very important thing this winter. Why not do something extra for the poor, whether that's do some extra volunteering, do some extra, put some extra money for them with a, a local ministry of some kind. Very important. Yep. And, um, you know, this whole coronavirus hysteria, um, there are actually, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and a friend of theirs works with the Sisters of Life, um, who are pro-life sisters. Um, and they were talking about how their work has been stifled because of like not being allowed to go do things like serve the poor because of not being allowed to gather, et cetera. It's totally insane. This whole, uh, again, you know, I, I harp on this off often, but what's going on right now is so diabolical because it's up from down, it's left from right, it's everything is reversed, the devil reverses everything to turn it into a farce. And the fact that nuns who devote their lives, even the Sisters of Charity, are having problems serving the poor because they're not allowed to go and gather or whatever. Like, you know, in the name of saving lives, they're just gonna let the poor die because at least if they die of starvation, they won't die of coronavirus. And uh, so this Christmas is a time where a lot of people are gonna be needing help. Uh, if you have family, like we decided as a family, and this is not holier than that. We just, we usually get like one gift. We draw names, whatever. And we said, why don't we just do a charity this year? So there's a really good one that's uh, with the hospital. It's for 
moms that have to stay in town with their kids for special surgeries and things. And we just going to donate, donate to that Ronald McDonald house and they just, whatever. And, um, that's something you can do little things like that, where, you know, the money is going to be used well. And, um, especially this year, because the haves and the have nots, that gap is going to be so much wider in the next six to eight months because of this, uh, lockdown nonsense. Absolutely. Um, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but the here's a few scriptures on the judgment. I just want to go through a few of these. St. Paul says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Yeah. Hebrews 9.27. We must all be manifested before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone <clears throat> may receive the proper things of the body according to as he hath done, whether it be good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Um, we also have, so with this, with, when we think about judgment, which we've mentioned before, it's very important to avoid two extremes on the one hand presumption, which is where we have an excess of hope. We have a, a confidence in an overconfidence in God's mercy yeah. in the idea that he will pardon even the unrepentant. God will not pardon the unrepentant. He will damn the unrepentant. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the other extreme is despair, which is a lack of confidence in God's mercy with the idea, with the contrary error, that God will not pardon the penitent, mm -hmm. which is also an error. That the error is on both sides. So it's first an error in the intellect, which need to deny both of those errors because Ezekiel 18.23 says, I desire not the death of the sinner, but that he should be converted and live. Yep. God will pardon penitence. So what we need to be concerned about is making uh, uh, stirring in ourselves true contrition because otherwise we do go into despair or we go into presumption. Now, in my opinion, I think the best text for avoiding despair and presumption and uh, with a, in my opinion, the, the perfect meditation on the, the final judgment is the DAC Ray, which is a, an actually an Advent hymn, <laughs> believe it or not, an Advent hymn, which uh, was originally written for Advent. And I just want to read <clears throat> a few stanzas from D.A.'s e -ray. So it starts off like this. Day of wrath and doom impending, David's words with sibyls blending, heaven and earth in ashes ending. Oh, what fear man's bosom rendeth, when from heaven the judge descendeth, on whose sentence all dependeth. When the judge his seat attaineth, and each hidden deed arraigneth, Nothing unavenged remaineth. What shall I, frail man, be pleading? Who for me be interceding when the just are mercy needing? Think, kind Jesu, my salvation caused thy wondrous incarnation. Leave me not to reprobation. Faint and weary, thou hast sought me. On the cross of suffering bought me. Shall such grace be vainly brought me? Righteous judge for sin's pollution, grant thy gift of absolution ere the day of retribution. Through the sinful woman shriven, through the dying thief forgiven, thou to me a hope has given. So I think I, what I love about it is it's so dark and gloomy and it's filled with hope. It's filled with contrition. And so just reading through that is that's about twice as long as what I just read. But reading through that multiple times throughout Advent is a great way to meditate on the four last things. Mm -hmm. um, Kennedy, any final thoughts before we talk about the reset? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the first coming of Christ is is a reminder of the second coming of Christ. So it makes sense with Advent. When Christ comes, it's obviously very joyful, um, but it's a day of judgment and atonement for those who opposed him. You know, this is why, um, you know, Herod sought to destroy the, the innocents and things like that, because it was a, you know, the demonic is when Christ and, and everyone knows this with their own conversions interiorly or or in an external sense from actually becoming Catholic. The moment that you decide to follow Christ in your life, the the evil around you will sort of exalt itself in a way of almost retaliation um, in ways that you'll know when you see it. Um, and uh, also at times, certain like right now, the diabolical is, is just sort of on parade. Um, but that's actually in a way kind of a hopeful thing. I was thinking about this yesterday. I haven't listened to the uh, Father Ripperger's interview with Father Hailman uh, and Dave. Is it Dave Barry? Doug Barry? I can't remember. Um, I haven't listened to it. They have a podcast that I've listened to a few times, but apparently I'm talking to people who've listened to it. 
And, you know, when things the way they are right now is completely unsustainable. It's just, it is, it is. I mean, I don't know how it will end up, but it's not sustainable. I mean, you know, you push people into poverty, you, you, you psychologically abuse people, whatever. Somewhere in some places, something drastically will change like that right overnight. And Ripperger reminds us that that's how God works as well. Naturally speaking, there is no possible way for some to get out of some of these things. You know, you talk to people and it's like talking to zombies. You know, I was just, um, I was I, I'm, well, a couple months ago, I was literally showing something from the Toronto Public Health saying that, like, we record every death of a coronavirus person, uh, whether or not they died from it. And I showed it to a person who's otherwise reasonable. And they said, yeah, it just proves that coronavirus makes you die faster from other stuff. And I'm like, what are you talking? I just I was one of those things. I thought, anyway, things are so unreasonable right now that the only solution will be one that will be a supernatural or preternatural event. And when that happens, it's going to happen overnight. And we've seen this in history. You know, it happened in Portugal when they consecrated the nation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as per the instructions that that should have been done for Russia. But for Portugal, the country had a massive conversion. Salazar came in, who don't listen to your leftists, was actually a great Catholic leader, much like Franco. And the country thrived and got through the Great Depression and World War II without being scared like everybody else. So the, the point being is that the first coming of Christ illuminated the darkness right? Illuminated what was going on. But at the same time, it changed the world like that. And until we get to the second coming, there are moments like that where we're on the end times and we're in a very end timesy situation insofar as the morality and all those sorts of things. Like we are in, we are in a Sodom and Gomorrah right now in pretty much every country. But when things change, they will change unexpectedly and they will change. You'll wake up one morning and a series of international events will be happening that you never thought in a million years would happen and you'll be living in a different world. Um, and that's always how God works with these astonishing reversals. So perhaps Christmas can remind us to think of how unexpected that is. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, we're not going to have time to even get into Christmas gifts. So I just wanted to quick remind everybody <clears throat> the uh, meaning of Catholic.com. There is the resources page up here. Resources. This has all the net, all the most important books and resources that you need in every category, in, at least in my opinion, um, which is especially spiritual classics. If you have, if you, I mean, this is, I think, most importantly, if you have not read, <coughs> especially The Imitation of Christ, most importantly, and all these have free versions online too that are linked right here. So you can get them for free too. Anyhow, um, that's linked below. Take a look at it. Uh, the Great Reset. <clears throat> This is, I think, one of the silver linings of uh, the, the COVID-1984 is that the elites have been, completely shown their hand. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been working on this since day one for, for decades and decades. Uh, it's not about democracy. It's not no. about uh, majority rule. It's about the elites convincing us that mm -hmm. their plan is the best plan. So they've announced that they are going to uh, impose on the world their vision of a utopia. So yeah. we appreciate them being so candid with us because that's what they've been doing for decades and generations and really hundreds of years, I would say. Um, and so for a long time, they've they've said, well, it's all about liberty and equality and fraternity. And now they've finally shown their hand and said, OK, what we really care about is just imposing on, on you this utopian vision that, that benefits us. So. Uh, so I, I, we don't have a lot of time to go over this, but I, I mean, the things that I've seen, it seems like Steve Cunningham over at Sense of Fidelium, yeah, shout, shout out, he he has read a ton of their sources. They've been writing books about all their their great utopian dreams and Towers of Babel, and he's read a ton of that stuff. So Steve Cunningham is really great at Sense of Fidelium. Um, they, he was with uh, Mike over at RTF, and they did a show yeah. together. Uh, he ju was just on reason of theology as well. He seems to be one of the big experts out there on this topic. So, but Kennedy, what, what do we know that's true about the great reset? What do we know that's false about the great reset? What's well, real for one people, uh, you know, even here in Canada, Jason Kenny, who's our premier of Alberta. Um, he's the, I don't know. How should I put this? Uh, he's been the best of the worst. I mean, all of our provinces right now have lost <laughs> At their least <laughs> Yeah, he's like, 
I try to give these guys benefit of the doubt because I don't believe that we should have any of the restrictions the way that we have them because I just, I was reading yesterday, um, uh, the survival rate, if you're under 70, is 99.95 now. Like that's the actual data. When you take infection fatality rate, if you're under 70 years old, it's 99.95, not 0 0.5, 0 0.95. Um, <clears throat> and if you're over 70, it's 95% uh, baseline. And we know that's in, that includes people who die from any reason whatsoever and test positive. So it's probably much higher. Anyway, point being, um, if you're under 70, it's literally less than like the flu is higher death rate for people under 70 than the coronavirus. So I don't think they should have any of the restrictions the way they have it. However, when I try to put my head into the logic of these people, he, Jason Kenney in Alberta has been dealing with it as a reasonable person would do if it were a thing that should be dealt with like that, if that makes sense. So for example, like things are regional and he doesn't, and, and it doesn't close down things if there's no outbreaks. So here in Ontario, we have this blanket lockdown sweeping the province and retailers that have never had any positive cases at all are somehow getting shut down. Whereas in Alberta, it's like all the cases Cases are from, from this place and that place. Okay, that industry has to take a two-week break. Again, I don't agree, but the logic of it is more consistent. Jason Kenny was talking about <clears throat> the reset, and Trudeau is our prime minister. He's all over reset. He's an idiot. But um, Jason Kenny said he was approached by it because Alberta does big money. Alberta's oil. It's like there's tons of oil in Alberta. So these um, a lot of the world elite globalist class loves Alberta because there's tons of money there, and Jason Kenny being the premier, he, he just speaks in an interview and he says, I was asked to join the Great Reset. Like, like literally, they'd said, do you want to join our Great Reset? And he said, no. He's like, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this. We're just going to continue living like normal people and so forth. So mainstream politicians now are talking about it. Um, basically, the Great Reset, and this is going to be, a, I'm half joking here. It's like a boomer's stupid socialist utopia. This is the thing you have to realize about these people. They're all in their 80s. Seriously, like Klaus Schwab and his ilk, Klaus Schwab is the guy who runs the economic, World Economic Forum. These guys are all <clears throat> Francis Kennedy, Page. hold on a second. They're, <clears throat> yeah. Hold on, your, uh, your audio's choppy a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Am I coming I through okay? You, yeah. yeah, can you hear that me now? Like, oh, that, that's better now. Try it again. Try again. So okay. you, you were just can saying they were all in their 80s? They're all old. I mean, like Klaus Schwab is 82. I think is that you hear me good? Well, yeah, it's good. Yeah, that that's going through now. Okay, good. Okay. Go ahead. Um, they're all it's 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 like Soros. Okay, literally Soros was alive during during the Nazi persecution in hung in Hungary, where he's from. I mean, these people are really old, and these ideas. It's just the Great Reset. It's it's diabolical. So all of the the initiatives they're saying they have goals, but it's just it's take take every stupid thing that everyone's tried to do for the last 50, 60 years. Socialist ideas, environmentalist ideas, population control, don't eat meat, you know, um, uh, central banking, you know, take every single thing that you know is dumb and put that into a package and call that the Great Reset. That's what the Great Reset is. So it's communism, it's socialism, it's environmentalism, it's uh, globalism, it's all the isms except for Catholicism, uh, it's Freemasonry, it's just all those things. It's just another package. The devil has five or six tricks. And he just repackages them every once in a while and calls them a new heresy. And then when you study it, you go, that sounds exactly like Arianism. Because it is Arianism. It's just not called that anymore. And it's the same thing with the Great Reset. So it's very real. And it's going to happen. And it has already happened. I mean, if you if you don't think the Great Reset has already happened in your life, that's what you have to understand. You have to wear a mask in most places, even though you know it's stupid. Just read an article where in Portugal... Um, they are outlawing PCR tests because they're on average up to 90, 97% ineffective. <laughs> but you live in a place, for example, where you're in a case-demic where because of a, a test that could be almost 100% false. That's a great reset. Why? They've literally, the, the news media, if you've been watching the news, I had to watch this mainstream news thing the other day for research for something. And I felt like I was being psychologically abused. Like I, I could not believe. Yeah, because you were. <laughs> it, was, it was so insane. I thought, I felt, I felt sick. I thought, oh my goodness, my parents, you know, my, my, my uncles, like these, these older, they're sitting there and they're watching this every night. I said, I can't believe that they have the wherewithal to get out of bed and, and, and carry on the next day. It is so unbelievably satanic, all the stuff they're shoving down our throat. And that's what the great reset is being shoved because it's part and parcel with 
misinformation, socialist propaganda, and so forth. So the Great Reset's already happened, in my opinion, at least in a baseline. Um, and I think, this is my contention, because the devil's always a liar. It's not a, re not a reset, it's a collapse. It's like when the reformers called a reform, reform reformation. No, it's not a reformation, it's a revolt. Trent was a reformation. Um, you know, uh, Cranmer was a, was a, was a revolutionary. Okay. Yeah. The looting um, operation. Exactly. And the same thing with this, you know, um, our finance minister in Canada, Christy Freeland, she's literally never had a job in finance. Anyway, she's a finance <laughs> minister. <laughs> like you could go down to the local investment firm where the guy does that, you know, investors course where he gets certified on how to sell stocks and he would know more about the economy than this woman. Um, and She's talking like the way that they talk. I, I don't know if they're idiots or if they're possessed or if they're evil or all three. I think it's all three. And um, she was talking about basically, you know, we're going to need some stimulus because of the debt that this virus has caused. It's like the virus didn't cause any debt. You caused debt. <laughs> but um, the virus didn't make you to be an idiot with math. With math. And, um, and she basically was saying it was really strange. She's kind of laughing and smiling like, well, you know, there's a lot of money people have. That's just sitting in accounts and maybe there's a way we can activate that, whatever. And it's basically like, oh, they just want to take the savings of those with like, they're literally saying they're just going to try and take your savings. Now they're going to package it as something. They'll call it like, uh, you know, stupid program, limited stimulus thing, and then give you some sort of tax break on something in a new way. They'll package it in some way, but that's part of the reset. They're just going to basically try marxism has never gone away and all of those people who are of that age this is the thing right all these marxist hippies they were all raw raw in the 1960s right but then they all finished their degrees and got jobs as professors now they're all about to die and they're all going we better do this thing uh because we're all going to be gone soon they've raised a generation of people who are sheep and who are followers but can't do anything so this is why personally I'm worried about it in the immediate. I am like, I'm, you know, I've, I've realized Canada functionally may function like a third world country within the next couple of years. And I mean that, I don't mean that alarmist, but the debt is going to be insane. The, the hospitals are going to have crazy weights. Every, like these things are objectively going to happen. Um, it's going to be a lot of bribes and a lot of who, you know, and whatever to do stuff. I think that's going to happen pretty soon in Canada. Um, but all of these, uh, this, the people that they're, they're, these people that are in their fifties and sixties who are following the great reset people, they don't know how to do anything. All they know how to do is work for the man. All they know how to do is work for an institution and do what they're told by the news and the government, all the people in the news and the government that run these things, the Rupert Murdoch's of the world, these, you know, big guys, they're all dying. And it's that double edged sword. It's like, you've created a, you've created a bunch of lemmings. But when you leave the lemmings alone, then they're all just going to walk off a cliff. And ultimately, I think that's what they want. You know, uh, Jordan Peterson once said, you know, people try to figure out the motivation of Hitler, for example, because he was a maniacal weirdo. And uh, Jordan Peterson basically said, "What? how did Hitler die? And he died basically under a burning city and killed himself in Berlin. And um, Peterson said there's, a, there's a, um, a principle in psychology. It's where you infer motivation from the result. You know, it's kind of like, well, why did so-and-so go on a killing spree and then get shot by the cops? And it's like, because he wanted to go on a killing spree and get shot by the cops because he was insane. Right now, this whole great race set thing, in my opinion, is a, is a form of collective insanity. And they do want things to collapse. And that's exact. So that's what they want. So don't look at like, it's not ulterior motive. It's not 4D chess. It's just, it's the, it's the final flickering of the flame that's just on its last burning and they need to put all the gasoline possible on it possible on it in order to have what they've always wanted which is a totally socialistic utopian society which ultimately will fail yeah this is something we'll continue <clears throat> talking about as the great reset reset not only shows its hand but continues to impose itself and i like what you're saying that the great reset has already happened i mean i would argue this is decades mm -hmm. perhaps centuries old because at this point, everybody grows up yep. with halfway thinking the Great Reset already. The way that we're formed, like Father Ripperger has said, unless you have a very robust formation, you will become a modernist, period. Yep. Yep. If you yep. live in the year 2020, period. So that's all, all the more reason to 
get good books for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. you, you, so you, I, I think you, what you're saying is absolutely correct. We need to look at the bigger picture. Great resets already happened and half of us have already accepted it for all mm-hmm. whole life. So if we you need believe to it, you believe it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, so, uh, somebody will, will definitely continue. Um, the, uh, I got somebody asking how to contact me. Any, if anybody wants to contact me or Kennedy, you can send a contact to many of Catholic.com slash contact mm-hmm. that can you contact both of us that way. Uh, but here's a few questions. Tony says, how close do you think the great reset is to our time? So in terms of the Schwabian great reset, what do you think, Kennedy? Repeat that. Sorry. Oh, how, oh, to our time. Um, I think it's already here. Like the, 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 if they're talking about it, it's already happened, right? Um, they're already, uh, and this is the thing too, I should say, okay, this is a global thing. So, um, you know, how many people knew about the Uyghurs in China until a couple months ago, right? Like, you know, I mean, generally speaking, if you weren't somebody who was really looking into that sort of stuff, who knew, uh, no one knew about the, um, the Uyghurs, like the concentration camps of all the, the Muslim Chinese, like the ethnicity group, whatever. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It's total slavery, whatever. But it had already been happening for years. Um, they don't get millions of people into camps without robust infrastructure though, that's already been in place and has already happened. The same thing with the reset. It's already happened. There's already countries right now that are going to be in starvation mode or like large percentages, okay? The globe has 7 billion people or whatever. There, you know, 180 million people are going to be. Now, the thing is, these things for so many of us will be distant. So many of us will live in a society where um, we're, are, we're going to remain okay, relatively speaking. Like whatever happens economically in our country, the reality is that through inflation, through whatever, through debt, however, we're still going to go to the grocery store. There might be less selection. The food shortage is already happening. They've been happening all summer. If you go to the grocery store, um, you might not think much of it, but you think, oh, there's only one brand of coffee and there's usually six. That's a shortage. That's actually a pretty big deal internationally as far as trade goes, but you just don't see it. Um, these things have already happened. So the Great Reset, uh, if you're wearing a mask to go to the grocery store, you're already living in it. And I think uh, we're going to continue talking practically, but most importantly, you need to make contact with local food producers. Yes. Local f- farmers, uh, whether dairy farmers, meat farmers, uh, wheat farmers, corn, f- whatever grows in your area or lives in your area in terms of livestock, make contact with them and start buying from them. Mm-hmm. Just switch over from the grocery store to the local producers. So you can make contact with your community and understand and get make contact with them. And obviously they would suffer too, but this is this is the way to shield yourself because the international trade is collapsing. And so yeah. um this is what's this is what's happening. So, you know, make contact with them, switch over your food sources, um, think about your long-term finances. We're gonna talk all about that stuff as time goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, but stockpile food. Uh, guns and ammo, uh, not only for protection against Marxists, but for hunting, uh, learn how to yeah. fish. I, I live, I'm fortunate enough to live in a, in a region of, of the country where you can fish all over the place. You can get food all over the place with just fishing and it's mm-hmm. really easy. So, um, yeah, lots fishing of, is actually better than hunting. Like for a lot, yeah, like, it's a lot easier it's, than hunting. <laughs> and if you're not an experienced hunter, you will have no idea what you're doing. Seriously. Yep, exactly. I, I don't go yeah, hunting. That's, that's, don't a, that's a really good point. Yeah. Fishing, fishing you can do. We need to become fishers. Very yeah. easily. Fishers um, of men. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, we're going to continue talking uh, long term. I think the, the diff- most difficult thing to manage is long term money mm-hmm. because it's already difficult to manage and that's going to become more difficult depending on what, on what they pull. Yeah. So we're going to continue talking about the practical things to get through the Great Reset as it's already happened. Mm-hmm. And so let's offer up and our father to ask the Holy Spirit for counsel, continuing for this this gift, because we really need the gift of counsel more than ever in this time, which mm-hmm. is supernatural prudence. Mm-hmm. When we really need it, when we're in a situation where it is extremely uh, dire yeah. yeah, and confusing, because we don't always know what to do, and this is totally true 
in this case. So it's all for Bernard Father for that. Also, the repose of John Morehouse. Mm -hmm. Please support his widow and his children. Uh, this is a perfect. This is a perfect example of what we're talking about about helping the poor. This is somebody right here who needs tens of thousands of dollars, and we're giving you this opportunity. So anything you can give to the Morehouse family, please donate. Uh, also, Thanksgiving for Patrick's daughter. So let's pray. Nomine Patris sit fidi spiritus sancti. Amen. Pater nostra et quies in cedis sancti vicetto nomen tuum ad veniet regnum tuum via voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie et dimitti nobis debita nostra sicut et nos dimittimus debitoribus nostris ne nos inducas in tentationem sed libera nos am malo. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, let, let light perpetual shed upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.